Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kara, for those wonderful words. I'm here to deliver a keynote on institutional issues and governing governance issues as they affect the water sector in developing countries, especially in, in Africa. Now, the situation on the water supply, I think you all know, 2.1 billion people lack access, so it's a very, very big problem. And therefore, the topic we are covering today is very, very pertinent. Now, looking at the issues that the water sector, especially in developing countries, face, you can see there are so many, and I want to go through them. One of the things we face, especially in developing countries, is unfocused and disoriented regulation, regulatory system. We in Africa especially, we have this habit of copying, copying systems from developed countries and just planting them in our countries. We don't understand them and we end up getting into problems. The institutional arrangements that don't shield utilities from, from political capture are also an issue. And of course this is caused by the mere fact that water is a problem. So every politician who is elected wants water for the next election. And if you don't have the correct institutional arrangements, then that becomes a problem already. Then the other issue is the issue of institutional arrangements that don't allow payment of incentives. I know in national water, as I would show you in Uganda, we pay incentives. But by working through working with other utilities in Africa, we found out that it is very, very difficult to pay incentives, even when they are, they are being embedded in contracts. When they are earned, paying them becomes a real, a real issue. Then we also have the issue of lack of operational autonomy. Operational autonomy, and even where you have it, the issue of oversight. Utilities don't have a strong M&E departments, strong M&E units to oversee operations in those branches where they have given autonomy. The other issue is uh, overrunning on donors. Most of the African utilities, they don't think, they don't open their eyes to anything else. They want money from donors, donors, donors. It is the song of the day. Without looking at the internal resources, can't you leverage investment resources from being efficient, from making money, using your money, and then the donor money comes to augment what, what you are doing. The other issue is duplication of roads. We have so many institutions in Africa doing the same thing, and that is a wastage of resources, as you know. Now, coming back to Uganda, there are a few facts about Uganda as a country. It has about 42 million. It is the 34th uh, uh, ranked country in terms of population. And its growth rate is 3.2. I think it is, it excels in producing people. 3.2% growth rate. Its GDP is about 5%. And the water coverage is not so bad, but it's also not good. The urban water coverage is about 71%. The rural water coverage within a distance of 1,000 meters is about 70. And on this urban water coverage, 70% of it is under national water and sewage cooperation. Now, about national water, the company which I am the CEO of, it is a public-owned utility. I always tell my people that we are publicly owned, but we operate like a private sector, meaning that we look at customers, we look at costs, we look at 
everything that a private company does. Our mandate as a company is to provide water and sewage services to all the urban centers of Uganda, where the minister has given us authority to do so. And our vision is to be the leading customer service-oriented utility in the world. That gives us momentum. It gives us impetus to try to do well. And we have a mission which has issues of quality, issues of customer care, issues of sustainability. Before I go into the, some of the other issues, I want to show you how the performance of national water has been evolving over time. As you can see, the number of towns where the corporation operates now has grown from 24 about seven years ago to now about 240 towns. So the jurisdiction, the operational jurisdiction of national water has dramatically increased. And I think this was the subject of this presentation. The coverage is about 78%, having gone up from 75. And most importantly is the issue of operating surplus. Very few institutions on the Af water institution on the African continent make positive operating margins. You can see 1998 National Water was operating a deficit operation uh, about seven years ago. It was about 30, and now we are talking of 112 uh, Uganda shillings, which is, means that the capacity of the organization to finance its own investment has drastically gone up. Now, coming to the challenges of expanding water and sanitation services to secondary towns, remember I've told you we've moved in the last five years from 24 towns to 240 towns. The challenges we have faced as a corporation is the issue of non-cost recovery tariff. When you go to these towns, you need money for investments. So if you have a tariff which is not a cost recovery, then you have an issue of investment, of how you finance your investments. The low economies of scale, the towns we have gone to, some of them have low economies of scale and therefore, they are more costly to operate. The pressure to increase coverage, sometimes with no matching financial budget. Politicians want us to go into those towns and deliver services without money. So that has been one of the challenges. Inadequate staff capacities, because when you expand drastically, then you have an issue of staff to run those towns. So we have had to catch up, to adapt, and train our staff very fast, both the technicians and the managers, to catch up with these challenges. Institutional conflicts. When you, you are given these towns, the, the, the institution where these towns are coming from has a problem with you. So we have had to also juggle around with some of those challenges. One of the lessons we have learned is that with a very good institutional arrangement, National Water has a very good legislative arrangement that shields it from political pressure. The board is the deciding arm, and therefore the minister cannot come. The minister can only beg for something to be done, but he cannot direct because the law does not allow him. If the minister asks me, can you do this? I will tell him put it in writing, and he will not do it. He will not do it. So the best thing he can do is to discuss with me, is to discuss with the board in order for things to be done. So you don't have the right institutional arrangement, you are in problems. The minister cannot say increase the tariff. It is my board who must see that the tariffs can be increased and propose to him. So he cannot direct that reduce, that increase like that. The other lesson we have learned is collective leadership. You want to run these institutions very well, efficiently, please involve everybody. Involve the board, involve your managers, involve the staff, so that you are all owning up whatever you are doing. The other one is 
individual and, and team accountability. I've gone to some countries where it is very, very difficult to hold anybody accountable because they have a strong union. You cannot sack anybody. But in national water, people are held accountable through what we call individual performance agreements. You either perform or you go home. And you don't do that, you will never realize anything. So as you can clearly see, these people are signing individual performance agreements. And the agreements have targets, they have obligations, they have incentives, so that when you perform, you get paid more. If you don't perform, you get penalized. Just here, we are accounting to the public. We are telling the public what we are supposed to achieve, what have you achieved, and you give them opportunity to also ask you. And in most cases, when we are doing this, the minister is also seated there. So if you have not been doing your work very well, you are put to shame for not doing your work well. Then the momentum to serve everyone, you must have that momentum. Some of us in National Water, we believe the best return of the shareholders' money is actually the social return. How many people have you served? And this is the belief of the board. This is the belief of management. We don't believe in people carrying water on the heads because the head is for thinking. The head was never created to carry water. So this belief is with so many people in national water. And so everybody, every day, wants to see additional connections done for the people of Uganda. Another lesson we have learned is to balance between centralized and decentralized systems. It is not one or the other. It is how do you balance. And normally the factors which determine especially on sewerage is the topography. If you don't have a topography that allows sewage to flow by gravity from one point to another, then you may have to go for decentralized systems. The other one is the economies of scale. Does it help you to have one head office and several branches? The other one, of course, is the other support services you are using, how they are distributed. So at the end of the day, we have learned that it is good to balance between centralized and decentralized systems. Maintaining the economic principles, you must charge the right tariffs. In Uganda, we have the indexation formula. Our tariff is, is continuously regulated according to the foreign exchange uh, changes, the, the inflation. If the power tariff increases, our tariff is automatically adjusted so that it is protected against erosion. We are also very, very careful with our costs. We keep our costs down, and we also keep efficiency up so that we can leverage investments for more extensions. Using technology, IT, you can see the, the, the technological things we have invented. We have invented our own bidding system. I've told our people, please don't buy a bidding system from anywhere, because those people who are selling you the bidding system are people like you. You cannot go and study, and you then when you come here, you specialize in buying from people. You study, use your knowledge. Come and use your knowledge. So all these solutions, the e-payment system was developed by us. So our people pay through mobile money. They pay through e-payments e e e e through the banks. We have also created an e-inventory system, e-procurement system, e-payroll system, and so on and so forth. The only thing we do when we are proliferating this technology, we make sure that technology is not a solution. New technology is not a solution in itself. It must, be, it must come at the right time. It must come evolutionary, not revolutionary. You don't just come and jump in with a new technology. Because people must buy in, in the new technology. So we have been very, very careful how we work on the mindset of our people to make sure that they buy this technology and they are able to work with this technology. 
The other issue is the role of smart staff engagement. You don't engage your people, you are just wasting time. There is no organization that is better than its people. For us, that's very, very important. So most of the time, we are engaging. You can see here, I was talking to staff, encouraging them, telling them how their careers are going to grow when the organization grows. The staff must know that when the organization gains, they also gain. And that can only be done through continuous engagement. The other issue is employee buy-in through incentive mechanism. We have one of the most complicated incentive formula. You can see it there. That formula is used to calculate incentives for staff every month. You perform, you can see it is a factor of the cash operating margin, working ratio, non-revenue non water. We have Mr. Non-revenue water here. Then we have the water sales. So these, you achieve them, you get incentives. Any slight movement in these parameters, you get incentives. And these parameters are continuously changing. If we find that we are now doing very well in the working ratio, we will we'll drop it and introduce another one where we need to drive performance. The other one is putting emphasis on career growth. As I said, you cannot run an institution without showing the people that you care for their career growth. The people you see there are people who are graduating. Even those who didn't go to school, we have looked at how they can be trained, how they can be skilled, so that they can repair these pipes with the knowledge, with the current knowledge. Not only the knowledge, but the current, the current knowledge. Then emphasizing external stakeholder engagement. We like working with external people, the politicians, the civil society, the religious people. It is very, very important for us to work with religious people because you go to church, if a religious person in Uganda, people respect, they, they like churches. They are not like uh, many places. They like churches. You find when people have finished praying, they allow you to talk, the people will absorb the, the message. They believe the message has been delivered by God. So it is very, very good to work with people, to work with churches, to work with mosques, so that information can, can flow. I want to conclude by saying that do your little bit of good where you are. It's those little bits of good put together that overwhelm the world. You do little. In National Water, we have done little by little. And we think we are moving. We are not yet there, but we are moving. So I want to thank you very much for listening to me. I want to thank IWA for welcoming me to come and share with you these lessons. And thank you very much once again for listening.